words of power because we are kings and our words matter. Just increase anointing is there. See, this is how the anointing works. It takes you right in the middle of the famine, in the middle of the recession, and makes you prosper. Everybody's graph is going like this, your graph is going like this. <laughs> it is all against uh, normal uh, things in the world. It's against the order of the world. This is God's blessing. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart and my portion for Sam Chaladurai invites you to a special pastor seminar at AFT Chennai on the 20th, 21st and 22nd of January 2016 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Please note that all messages will be in Tamil only. Prior registration with a fee of rupees 700 is required. You can register online at www.refsam.org or you can call us at the numbers on the screen. We look forward to seeing you there. The book of Revelation, chapter 1. Let me read to you the last portion of verse 5 and then verse 6. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. It says here that not only has he washed us from our sins with his own blood, but made us kings. We've been talking about how that God, through the redemption, has literally made us kings. These are things that sometimes the Christian church has failed to touch upon and teach. But unless we teach these things, really, people 
will not have a better attitude about themselves. You see, many people are saved and they're holy and good people and so on. But Christian people in general have such a low opinion of themselves. Many years ago, they conducted a Gallup poll in America where they learned that people that go to church have a lower self-esteem than people that don't ever go to church. Now, that's a very bad reflection of what the church is doing. You know, I felt very bad when I read that. That people who go to church have a lower self-esteem than people that don't go to church. That's because the church concentrates too much on how we are nothing and uh, we are just dust and we are just worm and so on. That uh, we have been very strong on but we have never taught people that we are kings. When we teach on things like that then people will lift up their head and begin to feel better about themselves and walk with confidence before God and before men. It's very important. The quality of our life is very much determined by this kind of teaching. So that is why I'm coming to these subjects because these are sometimes left out in the church. So we've been talking about kings. We talked about the authority of the king, how it's in his words and through words he rules and reigns. Then we started talking about the wealth of the king. The wealth of the king is different from the wealth of an ordinary person. The ordinary person goes out and sweats it out. That's how he earns his wealth. Whatever wealth he's earned, he'll tell you stories about how he sweat it out. That's his thing. But the wealth of a king does not come by his sweat. The wealth of a king is usually his by inheritance. From his dad's days, from his granddaddy's days from many generations they've accumulated wealth and left it for him therefore the wealth of a king comes by means of an inheritance and the bible tries to tell, to tell us that our wealth is not like an ordinary person's wealth where we sweat it out and get it our wealth is like the wealth of a king where we inherit it because God gives it to us now that's something astounding to me that is something to think about. That is something to look into. We need to understand it. So I took you back to the book of Genesis and showed you how God made the entire earth and gave it in the hands of man. God made man very wealthy. <laughs> A lot of people are afraid to even mention this word wealth. But I boldly mention it today. That God made man wealthy beyond anything that he could ever imagine. He gave him the whole earth. And he gave him all his provision. Everything that he would ever need was already there. Then only man was created. So later on God gave him work also. But his work was not to give him, uh, the work was not to provide for him. Work was never meant by God as a means of provision. God never intended that man through work must find his provision. God always had it in his mind that he will be the provider. That God will be the provider. That the work that he gives to man will be his assignment. That's his assignment in life. That's his call in life, I would say. What I'm doing now is my call in life. This is not my job in life. I've not joined a job. <laughs> I have taken on a call. And I'm answer I've answered a call. And I am fulfilling a call in my life. When I'm preaching, I am responding to the call of God in my life. I'm happy to fulfill my call in my life. I enjoy it. I enjoy preaching. I enjoy doing this ministry because that's my call in life. Every one of you have a call. Maybe to be a doctor, teacher, whatever, you know. And some of you are, have found your call and are right into it. Some of you are still searching for it. But everyone has a call in life and it's wonderful to be in your call and do what, you know, God has called you to do. But uh, your work is not supposed to be your means of provision. God is the provider. Never forget that. If you make your work your provider, then you'll always live in lack and want and insufficiency because work is a very poor provider. <laughs> Some of you already know it very well. It is not a very good provider. As a provider, it's no good. <laughs> it 
but as a call it's good because it was ne never meant to provide god is the provider everybody say god is my provider jehova jaire is my provider we must never get away from that so i showed you that uh, the wealth uh, that we obtain as kings in this world is different kind and proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 says it very beautifully it says the blessing of the lord it maketh rich not my sweat the blessing of the lord it maketh rich not my hard work the blessing of the lord it maketh rich not my working night and day the blessing of the lord it maketh rich that's the thing that makes me rich nothing else i may work hard night and day i may i like my call sometimes i'm very busy i'm going here and there preaching and going and coming and so on and having no time at all but the blessing of the lord it maketh rich everybody say it maketh rich <laughs> that it is very important there and then it says and he adds no sorrow with it the word sorrow means hard labor pain toil that's what it means other translations render it like that amplified version and so on you'll find the word toil in there so he adds no toil with it adds no hard labor with it when the blessing of the lord is there there is no toil this is hard for some people to believe because they've believed in toil all their life like one man said to me i've believed in toil and i've been toiling 25 years now you're telling me there's no toil too bad <laughs> The Bible says there's no toil. <laughs> Too bad that nobody told us about the blessing and how the blessing gets rid of the toil. Because the blessing does the work. Therefore, there is no toil. When there is no blessing, then you toil. You see, that's the problem. When people work without a blessing and people try without a blessing to make a living, that's, that is when they toil. But with the blessing of the Lord, there is no toil. Right? There's no hard labor. There is no sweat. The sweat of the brow and the sorrow that it mentions here in Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 is mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 after the fall of man. All this we have studied. And I showed you one of the reasons for the toil is that man has been disconnected from God since the fall. Before he had direct connection with God, God just gave him ideas. He was never at loss for ideas. He didn't have to wonder what to do. God showed him what to do. He told him, do this, and everything was fine. But after the fall, man had to rely upon his own mind. The sense knowledge I talked about, right? His own mind, his five senses, that's all he could rely on. He could not rely on God because he had no connection with God, no relationship, no fellowship with God, couldn't talk to God, couldn't get in, any input from God. So he had to lean upon his own understanding. That's why the Bible says don't lean upon your own understanding because that brings toil. When you lean upon your own understanding and you got to depend on your brain to just come up with ideas and do things, then you have to go on trial and error and thousand trials you have to make and errors you have to face in order to arrive at the answer. If you came to God, God would have told you the first time what the answer is. When God gives you one idea, it'll take you sky high. When God gives you one idea, it'll make you tremendously wealthy. God is like that. God makes things easier. But people in, after the fall have lost their connection with God. So that's one reason. That is, sense knowledge has been one reason why there has been toil in this world. I'll tell you another reason why Christians still toil. Because there may be a question in your mind. Well, you say there's no toil, but I toil. Or somebody toils. I see many Christians toiling. What is the reason? Why Christians toil? I'm going to cover that today. The reason is unrenewed mind. And let's talk about it today. The unrenewed mind. Because people's minds are renewed, not renewed to the word of God. They're not thinking biblically. They're not thinking in God's terms. They're Christians. They've been saved, baptized, and good people, and holy people, and so on. But when it comes to work, when it comes to all of these things, they don't think biblical thoughts. You know, when it comes to provision, they don't think biblically. And therefore, uh, they toil because of their unrenewed mind. You see, to increase in life, 
should come naturally to us because we have an anointing to increase. If you don't believe it, go to Genesis 1 verse 28. When God made man, he told him, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue everything and have dominion over everything. Right? We've read it so many times. Be fruitful and multiply. To be fruitful in life, to produce something useful and to live a productive life and fruitful life is something that must come naturally for us. We have an anointing for it. We have a blessing that is working. Yeah, sure, the fall undid that blessing, put us away from God, but now we are blessed through Jesus Christ. We have come back to God. We have come back to the Garden of Eden. We have come back to that state where we are in connection with God. Therefore, increasing should not be very difficult. First, you got to remove the thought from your mind that increase is very difficult in this world. No, increase is not difficult because you have an anointing to increase. You have a blessing to increase. You have a power that has been given to you that is called blessing that will cause you to increase very easily. God put increase in a built-in manner in everything. Every tree has seeds in it because you can produce thousand trees from it. When you look at an apple, don't look at how many seeds there. You look at a seed and see how many apples are there in one seed. Increase is limitless. One seed has so many apples and one apple has so many seeds. And if you just keep multiplying, it'll just go to millions and millions and millions. I calculated one time and showed you how increase can happen in abundant measure in millions. Increase is built in. Even a tree, a cat, a dog, fish, everything. When God put the fish in the sea, he said, multiply greatly. That's what he said. Because they have the power to multiply. God has put it within them to multiply. They can increase. You'll never out of run out of fish in the sea. Because God has put that anointing to multiply. It'll multiply. It'll, it'll just increase and fill the ocean. And the same thing he said to the trees and the beasts and all of those things. And much more to man. Be fruitful and multiply. We have multiplication inside. We have the ability to increase inside, built in. So I say to you, in my mind I should begin to think that I am anointed to multiply, I am anointed to increase, I am anointed to grow financially and every other way I am anointed. I have God's blessing upon me. I can multiply and grow and increase like anything. That increase is in me. I am made for increase. Increase is built within me. See, when God chose Abraham, see, after the fall, everybody forgot about the blessing and all of that. So God chose Abraham and started all over again because Adam missed it and talked about the blessing. As soon as he picked him out, the very first words that God speaks to him is blessing. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. I'll bless you, make you a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I'll make your name great. And then he said, through you all the families of this earth shall be blessed. These are the very first words that God said to Abraham. The words of blessing. The first thing, the very first thing that God wants to convey is blessing. And as soon as God spoke blessing upon his life, he says, all right, you come to the land that I want to show you and takes him and there was famine in that land. And Abraham must have wondered, my God, he spoke about blessing and all of that and brings me to a land of famine. But then he goes to Egypt and you know the story how the Egyptian king thought his wife was so beautiful. And Abraham lied. It was a half lie because it was his cousin sister that he's married. So he said, it's my sister. And so the king thought he'll take the wife. And he wanted to reward his brother-in-law very well. So he took the wife to the palace and gave, the, gave Abraham, who was brought such a beautiful woman, all kinds of gold and silver and cattle and everything, and just showered upon him all kinds of material things. God just waited until everything was given. Then at night, God told him, don't touch her. You'll die if you touch her. <laughs> She's another man's wife, so be careful, she said. he said. He said, I didn't know that. That man told me that's his sister. He said, no, I'm telling you that's his wife, God said. Don't touch her, return her to him. So next day morning, he said, what man, you came and lied to me. You should have told me the truth. 
here is your wife, take her back, you know. So he returned the wife, but he did not ask him to return the stuff. So Abraham was an ordinary man, didn't have any riches. Overnight, just like that, without any hard toil and labor, no sweat, just became rich, just like that. When he came out, see in chapter 12, you read the story. And in chapter 13, it talks about him coming out of Egypt. It says, Abraham was very rich. With gold, silver, male and female servants and donkeys and whatnot, you know, everything he's had, you know. Plenty of stuff. This whole battalion he comes out, very rich man. God made Abraham very rich. Just increase anointing is there. See, this is how the anointing works. It takes you right in the middle of the famine, in the middle of the recession and makes you prosper. Everybody's graph is going like this. Your graph is going like this. <laughs> it is all against uh, normal uh, things in the world. It's against the order of the world. This is God's blessing. So Abraham was living a totally different kind of life. And uh, one thing he missed that was he didn't have a child. So God comes to Abraham and says, all right. Because Abraham was complaining. I don't have a child. My servant is going to become the heir of all these things that I have. You've given me everything but never gave me a child. He's getting old also. So God told him, all right, you come here. Look upon the stars of the sky. Can you count them? He said, no, I can't count them. He said, your seed will be like that. God could have told him, I'll give you a son. That would have been a big thing for him. But for God, just giving a son is not enough. He wants to give a multitude as a seed. Because God is the God of abundant life. He always gives in abundance. Have you ever thought? The psalmist said, my cup runneth over. Many years ago, I asked this question. Why running over? God who pours in the cup, doesn't he know when to stop? When it's running over, I would stop if it's running over. I won't let it run over. I wouldn't let one drop run over. I would stop it. But God, it says, psalmist says, my cup is running over. I said, why God? Why it's running over? It's always running over. All kinds of incidents in the Bible show that it's always running over. Peter's boat was running over. 5,000 people ate five loaves and two breads. It was running over with two ba 12 baskets full. Running over. Why let it run over? When you ask that question, you'll find the answer. God says, that's the way I am. Because I don't want to just bless you. I want it to run over so others can catch the run over. Lot was with Abraham and he was catching over what was running over and he became rich just by the run over. <laughs> just by the overflow he became rich, Lot. You know, he was an un uninvited guest. He was just hanging around with Abraham, <laughs> unwantedly. But just because he was near the man whose cup was running over, he was catching all the time. So God says, the reason I want your blessings to run over is this. Because if your cup is full, you'll take your cup and keep it inside your house for you and your two. <laughs> but I don't want to like that. I want it to run over, run into your house, run out of your house, run into the streets, run everywhere because I want everybody to be blessed through you. I want it to run over. <laughs> Increase is such an anointing. It's just an anointing that works in us. We are blessed to, to increase. We are blessed to run over. We are blessed to overflow. Overflow is our blessing. God-given blessing. Amen? Everybody say, overflow is my blessing. <laughs> you must overflow. But the thing is, a lot of people don't believe that. You know, that's the problem. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. And here Abraham's servant goes to find a wife for Abraham's son. And uh, he speaks, chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And now listen, and the Lord had blessed him in all things. Everybody say in all things. In all things. There is no area in Abraham's life in which he was not blessed. In every way he was blessed. God had abundantly blessed him in all things. And then in verse 34, in the same chapter, in verse 34, he tells the family of the girl. 
that servant meets the family of the girl that he has chosen for Isaac and he tells them this and he said I'm Abraham's servant he's introducing himself and the Lord has blessed my master greatly he was not like some Christians he says I'm Abraham's servant I work for this man of God actually he's a great man of God but he has nothing <laughs> no see how what a contrast it is you know what a contrast the Bible is to what people have portrayed the Bible to be you know I remember in those days we used to pray God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob but we never believed in the blessing of Abraham we didn't have no money we didn't have nothing but we said God of Abraham God of Isaac if Abraham saw us he would have said shut up you know <laughs> you don't believe in none of my blessings you don't have none of my blessings then why are you calling him God of Abraham he's God of Abraham because he is the God who blessed Abraham with in all things and he is the same God that blesses us it's the same covenant the same blessing that has come through us come to us through Jesus Christ amen clap our hands Fighting for us. God is fighting. 